from Jill from Northern Kentucky. Hello. 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 Hi, Cozy Taylor from Kentucky. Hello. Hello. We'll give people just a couple more minutes to join. It's being live streamed, just so folks know. Okay. So you're live on Facebook at MHA Mental Health America of Kentucky's page. There we go. 41 out of 112 isn't bad for the right on time. <laughs> Welcome everyone, still admitting like crazy. So give us just a minute here. Got lots of folks joining us. Lots of friendly faces, glad to see a lot of you today. Megan, do you wanna start it off or do you want me to? I am happy to start it off if you can keep up with the waiting room. <laughs> I can do that. Hi everyone, welcome to our 988 webinar, kind of giving you the basics of what to expect from the upcoming rollout um, and how you can help support the rollout. Um, my name's Megan Cole, I'm the Kentucky Chapter Area Director for the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. I am joined today by my partner in crime, Marcy Timmerman, who is the Executive Director for Mental Health America of Kentucky, um, and Beck Whipple, our amazing statewide suicide prevention coordinator through the Department of Behavioral Health. Um, throughout today's presentation, we're going to give some background information on 988. So even if you don't really know anything about what's going on with 988, you will by the end of today's uh, webinar. We're also going to talk specifically about the lifeline structure in Kentucky because Kentucky does have a very unique structure. Um, and then future plans for 988, what we're anticipating for the future and hoping for the future, and then how you can support the rollout of 988. Um, so um, throughout today's presentation, if you have questions or anything, please feel free to drop them in the chat um, and we will answer them the best that we can. Um, it's really helpful to hear your questions because that's gonna help us put together an FAQ sheet that we can share out far and wide um, because I guarantee if you're having that question, you're not the only one having that question. Um, so it's very helpful for us when you ask questions um, and the three of us will try our best to keep up with the chat and to address all of the questions um, at the end of the presentation. These are your speakers today. Um, so I'm gonna just start out um, with some background information on 988 so you kind of know how this all came about. So in August 2018, the National Suicide Hotline Improvement Act was signed into law. I actually remember being in DC and advocating for this bill specifically, not only because we've done so much work on 988, but because I always loved that it was um, HR 2345. It was the easiest one I've ever been able to remember going into congressional meetings. Um, but this, this law directed the FCC to work with um, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration or SAMHSA um, to report on the feasibility of designating a three digit dialing code for the lifeline. So at the time we didn't know what that code would be. We just knew that we wanted to have a three digit code similar to 911. And then in August, 2019, the FCC and SAMHSA came back um, and indicated that 988 would be the optimal three digit number for the lifeline. Um, but they did know that additional resources would be necessary to support crisis call centers responding for 988 ca um, callers, um, just because we knew that with the three digit dialing code would come an influx in calls. Um, in October 2019 is when the National Suicide Hotline Designation Act was introduced and that supported 988 as a designated dialing code and it strengthened local call, uh, crisis response capacity to meet the increased demand. And then in July of 2020, 
Um, it, it was officially designated as uh, 988 and it needed to be nationally available by July of 2022. So, and then October, 2020, this became law. It passed through Congress unanimously. Um, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but it may have been the only bill to get through Congress unanimously in 2020. Um, it, it signed into law in October, uh, 2020 um, designates 988 officially, requires full implementation and access to 988 nationwide by July of 2022. Um, that date officially became July 16th, 2022. So we're coming up on it. Um, and something that we will talk a lot more about later is that this law also empowers states to enact their own laws to provide for 988 and crisis service funding. Um, so we'll expand on that later in the presentation. But for now, I'm going to hand it over to Beck so he can explain a little bit more about what to expect um, with the lifeline in Kentucky and how this is structured. Might help if I come off mute. Um, so yeah, welcome. Thanks, Megan, for that introduction. And uh, just reminding me uh, that July 16th is next Saturday. Um, and we are ready. Um, I know we are ready. We have been working. Uh, for some of you, this might be the first time you're hearing about 988. For some of us, this has been our lives for the last three years. Um, so I want to just kind of share a bit about the journey that we've had over the last three years. Um, and this is a national initiative, like Megan mentioned. Like This is happening in, in all 40 uh, or 50 states plus the three territories. So um, we have our own way of doing 988. And so I'm going to give you the Kentucky brand, um, the Kentucky version of 988, and what we're doing um, in partnership and in lots of different ways to make sure that 988 is successfully rolled out um, and is accessible and available and safe for all Kentuckians. So um, very excited about that. Um, you'll see just a quick overview of the structure. So the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline still owns 988. So the, um, in its very, very essence, 988 is just simply a number change. Um, we're going from a 10 digit um, hard to remember in crisis number to a three digit easy to remember in crisis number um, that will connect, uh, you know, callers here in Kentucky, um, but like, like we said, it, it's happening nationally. Uh, Vibrant, who is the owner operator um, of the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, they have over 180 uh, call centers um, across the U.S. and the territories. Uh, and Kentucky has 13 of those 180. And like Marcy mentioned, um, this is really uh, specific. Um, some states have one, some states have three, very, very few states, even the large ones have 13. So um, we are kind of doing this a little bit different in, the, in good old Kentucky fashion. So um, we run and operate our community, uh, our National Suicide Prevention Lifeline or our 988 lifeline, those are the same things. Um, so sometimes we get like language issues from losing, using old language to new language, um, but we operate our 988 lifelines through our community mental health centers. Um, all of these are nonprofits. There are behavioral health um, safety net. Um, every county in Kentucky has an assigned community mental health center. Um, and the call centers live within those organizations. Uh, and, and us here at the state, at a Department for Behavioral Health, uh, we are um, kind of in relationship with them in the sense that we contract and uh, do a lot of cool partnerships with our community mental health center. So uh, myself at the state, as well as my colleague who couldn't be here today because she's doing lots of other 988 things, um, Angela Roberts, um, her title is actually 988 Administrator. <laughs> um, so she has come on about four months ago, um, and that is her full-time role is, is to help sure or to help ensure that Kentucky rolls this out. Um, so Angela Roberts, and we'll provide her email at the end as well. So here is the kind of history of Kentucky's um, 988 rollout. So it started um, really back in, um, you know, 
when they kind of expanded outside of New York, because um, that's where Vibrant's headquarters are is in New York. Um, they expanded to across the states. Um, we had a couple centers that were already onboarded. Um, you know, seven counties um, was one of them. Penny Royal was one of them, River Valley. Those were some of the first ones um, to be able to say that they were accredited. To be a, a, life, a 988 Lifeline call center, there is very strict clinical standards and an accreditation process that takes darn near a year to get through. So these folks didn't wake up one day and are like, you know what, I'm gonna do this thing. Um, they have been working their tails off to make sure that they're meeting the clinical standards, meeting the requirements for accreditation. Um, and so you'll see that we've just expanded. So what we want is we want a caller, someone who calls in Kentucky, we want them to be um, routed to the most uh, local or regional center to them because who knows those regional centers better than the regional centers? Who knows what's available? Who knows, you know, kind of the, the ins and outs. So a lifeline call or a 988 call is routed by your area code and um, then the first three digits after that. So for example, I live in Louisville. So if I were to ever call 988, that would register my number as a 502 number. And then the next three numbers would say, oh, that person lives in Jefferson County then that was gonna send them to seven counties. So that's how the call center works, or that's how the call routing works. We do not use geolocation as of right now. Um, uh, that's one of the main differences from 980, or from 911. You'll also see that um, we have not only expanded to every county a primary call center, but we have now have 88% of our counties covered by a Kentucky backup center. So that means if I call, Megan is an, a call taker and she's busy, she's on a call, it will get sent to Marcy. Uh, you know, these are just examples. They're not actually the ones answering the calls. Um, so Marcy, again, another Kentuckian is answering that call on the backup. Because it's crisis, we're not messing around, right? These folks are needing services right away uh, and we want uh, preparedness. So you'll see here that the blue counties are counties that are covered um, by our Penny Royal Center um, down in the, in the kind of southwestern part of the state. Um, and they are the only center right now at this point that does backup, although we're looking at expanding that. And the, and the centers that are the counties that are not covered uh, is simply because Penny Royals being is their primary center um, and they can't be both the primary and the backup. So uh, very, very exciting. And again, this is unique to Kentucky to have this kind of coverage for the state in a primary call center as well as for the backup. And just that little bitty blank Fayette County, um, I haven't had the chance to update this map yet, but Fayette County is also being covered now um, and I need to update the map. So um, next. So what we're expecting across the states is an uh, increase in calls, right? If it's easier to remember, if we're talking about it more, um, you know, we're gonna we're going to anticipate and have anticipated and um, worked for almost a four times projected call rate. Um, Kentucky averages per year, which we're going to see in a bit, about twenty thousand calls a year, um, and we're thinking. In, uh, you know, in 2022 and 2023, we'll see that number just grow exponentially um, as folks become familiar. Uh, it is being promoted nationwide. Um, you can see my backdrop here. This is not something that we've made. There's a whole toolkit, which I think Marcy's going to get into, um, that's available for you all. Um, and we're, you know, we're also still trying to make sure we're thinking about um, our continued response to COVID, you know, we're we're uh, you know we're in resilience mode of kind of bouncing forward, but we're still very much dealing with the psychological, mental health impacts of kind of the pandemic and um, you know its devastating effects. So uh, we are uh, and have worked really really hard at getting our call centers up to speed. So we. We've dedicated specific funding from, um, from existing funding. We've received new funding. 
uh, and we're really working with them to expand their capacity. So you can see kind of the, the, the history here of our calls. Like I said, we've averaged just below 20,000 um, and they're expecting us to get about 42,000 calls. That's just inbound calls um, with, you know, before 2023. Uh, we're also, this is new um, to the to 988, is that they are going to offer text and chat. And right now we have one center in Kentucky that has the ability to do text and chat. Um, but I would suggest, I would, I would think that within the next six months, we'll have um, as, you know, way more that are, that have that capacity to do that. Uh, so if you are a text or a chatter and like to do that, want to um, get a part-time job or volunteer, just, you know, holler at us because we're going to have some jobs open. Um, so you can see that. So next, and I say we, I mean the community mental health centers. We've already seen, um, and these are numbers that I kind of live and breathe and swim in every month, my colleague Angela and I, uh, we have already seen, before 98 has been live, we have already seen a significant increase in callers to the lifeline. Um, and, you know, you, again, we we are living through a pandemic and we're living through some of, you know, some very trying times. And what we're seeing for callers this is what is reported by each of the call center directors is that not only we've seen a capacity increase, but the acuity of callers has increased. The length of time on calls has increased as well as um, like first time callers. So folks who are have never called are calling um, the lifeline. So we've already been seeing an increase before 988 has and you know is, is is in effect, which I think is great because it's again helping build our capacity before this big ominous go live date, which is next Saturday. Um, so you go to the next slide. Um, <laughs> we want to make sure again that this is answered. And we did a, a really big landscape analysis at the beginning of 2020 to really survey our call center directors and their staff. Um, and some of them, you know, over 50% of them said, yes, we're good with an increase in calls. Um, some were a little bit more unsure and some said yes, fully. Um, and so, you, you know, this is something that we've been working uh, a great deal on. Uh, and again, um, you know, thinking about that. So our, our state answer rate, our, our goal for in-state answer rate, meaning if you call in Kentucky, you'll be answered by a Kentucky-based center, both primary or backup. Our statewide plan is to have 90% of those calls answered in-state, meaning only 10 get bounced to the national backup system. Bounced, not unanswered. Um, and so to do, we have to work individually with these call centers to ensure that they're um, handling their regional call volume at that 90% level. Um, if you're getting 20 calls a month, you know, a, a four times increase is going to be significant. But, you know, for example, our seven counties in our new Vista line, they're, hundred, they're hearing hundreds of calls um, a month, you know, sometimes a week. And so an increase in calls like that is going to be really significant. So uh, our goal is to, again, 90% in-state, and that's for every, every center, but us across the state too. So I mentioned that 988 at its core is just a number change. Um, for some of you really organized people, you know, like if you move, you send out like, hey, I moved email. Um, that's really what's happening. It's like, hey, we've changed our number. Um, so this go live is really just like, hey, we changed our number. Um, but the thing that is really making 988 more of a movement, um, and I see Leanne Fitzpatrick on here is our DMS partner, which is, we couldn't do this without them, um, is that 988 is not just someone to call, but it's someone to respond and a community to support. Those are the three kind of big tenets. So again, not only is it just a, light, a number, but it's someone to respond that maybe it isn't just law enforcement, um, that is more of a mobile crisis or more of a co-response model where you have law enforcement with a social worker or with the peer support or paramedic. We have, we have um, a county that's working with paramedics and peer supports. Um, and those are folks that can come and really help be, um, you know, de-escalate the situation. But the cool part of 988 
is about 80 to 85% of the calls that come into 988 are de-escalated verbally. So that's, again, another difference between 988 and 911. 911, when you call, their, their um, goal is to get someone to you as quickly as possible. So they're going to assess the situation and then dispatch. 988's goal is to talk with you, to listen, to affirm, um, to validate, to, you know, to do all of those kind of things. And then the ultimate goal is to de-escalate you over the phone and get you next day services or services as quickly as possible. Um, but we want to expand 988 other than just an ambulance coming to get you or a, fire, a police department coming to get you and then taking you somewhere. We really want to, as a movement, um, create a community support where if I'm struggling with suicidal thoughts, I can say, hey, Marcy, my neighbor, you know, can you check in on me? Um, can, you know, like, can you help me? And where we're really destigmatizing mental health crisis and suicide, where we can collaborate, you know, if Marcy wouldn't think two thoughts if I was having a heart attack to do CPR. Um, she wouldn't think two thoughts about it. And we need to create that same community response for mental wellness. So that's a, a big part of what 988 is also trying to do. Um, and there's lots of different ways we're trying to do that. I mentioned um, uh, our Medicaid partners. They, they have a mobile crisis grant right now, a planning grant, where we're trying to um, think about mobile crisis a little bit differently um, and fund mobile crisis. So um, I'm, I've said this many times, but um, I'm a homeowner, and if I have a plumbing issue and I call a plumber, um, I need a plumber, and an electrician shows up, doesn't mean they're not a great electrician, it just means I need a plumber. Um, and so our mobile crisis team is those trained professionals with that mental health um, substance use expertise, similar to our quick, quick response teams, um, you know, that we're out there meeting the need of those folks in behavioral health crisis. Um, so you'll soon see and hear about an expansion of mobile crisis teams across the state, um, which I'm really excited to kind of hear about and be a part of. So the other thing is how can we um, keep folks that don't need to be in ERs out of ERs and how can we keep folks out of jail that don't need to be in jail for behavioral health crisis? So we need to think all of our alternatives such as crisis stabilization units, um, or, or cool down spots. So uh, many of you guys know our tailored, our tailored drop-off, drop-in sites for our, for our young adults. If it's a family, you know, if it's a family conflict and someone just needs like a moment of reprieve, they don't, they can't drive, they can't go anywhere. Like what's to say they can't be dropped off at a tailor site where there's trained peers, there's trained clinicians to be able to do some of that. These are just examples. Um, but we need to start thinking differently other than just, oh, someone said suicide, they're going to inpatient, they're going to, you know, um, be locked up in some way. So really expand our services. Um, we also are thinking about 23-hour kind of chairs um, in CSUs where it's really just that spot for cool down, maybe a, a quick med check, a quick, uh, you know, any of those kind of things. So you are seeing three people of an entire statewide coalition. Um, so we just passed our year mark in March of meeting. Um, and this is a 70 person team um, that is a small town in Kansas that, you know, that's where I came from. We have more, more people in our coalition than the town I came from in Kansas. Um, so it is huge. It's a coalition that's led primarily now by Angela Roberts, my colleague. Um, but we all help support her. And there are many different stakeholders. I see um, our friend Claire on here from the Kentucky Hospital Association. We have um, lots of different folks on there. If you would like to be a part, let us know. Um, or if you would just like to get the emails about the coalition meetings and recordings, we can also share those with you too. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, part of that coalition really helped um, and Marcy's going to talk about this next because I'm a state employee and I don't talk about funding um, or advocacy, uh, but part of that team really helped us secure a, a great deal of funding through House Bill 1, um, which uh, gave us uh, um, funding for 
uh, increasing capacity for 988 call centers, as well as helping with mobile crisis. So um, thank you to those folks that were able to help secure that funding. Um, again, really great. Uh, with 70 people in our coalition, uh, that is not something that we can do in a large group. <laughs> um, and 988, like I mentioned, is not just a phone number, it's lots of different things. So we've divided out um, into six subgroups that meet monthly, sometimes more than once a month. Um, but you'll see we have our actual crisis call directors, those folks that are running and operating and overseeing the call centers. We have um, a group of people um, who have lived experience of suicide or lived experience of loss of someone by suicide. Um, and they're really kind of our, 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 our heart and our North Star. Is what we're doing, the way we're talking about suicide, the way we're, we're talking about crisis, is it um, you know, person-centered? Is it you know, strength-based? Is it you know, not shying away from the hardship of it? but really kind of leaning into the lessons um, that we've all learned through this experience. So we have a, a group, we really would love more members of that group. So if you are a person with lived um, or loss experience related to suicide, um, please let me know. We would love to add you to the group um, to, to kind of, again, be our North Star, our advisory um, to all things that we do. Um, the other part, again, Marcy and Megan are going to talk more about, um, which is uh, advocacy and funding. Um, we have a 988-911 working group because the goal of 911 or 988 is we want to have the, the fancy keyword that they've been using is interoperability, which is like a Scrabble word, I think. Um, interoperability meaning that we have systems in place that if someone calls 911 because that's the, the number that they're easiest to remember, that that 911 operator can do a quick assessment and say, hey, I think this is a behavioral health crisis. Let me transfer to our regional 988 team um, so they can help kind of de-escalate and or activate those mobile crisis response. Um, there was a phenomenal um, program in Austin, Texas that has 988 as kind of their fourth entity of that dispatch. So fire, EMS, law enforcement, and mental health crisis. So if you haven't looked up the Austin, um, Texas uh, um, model, um, it's great. But yeah, you can imagine that there's lots happening within that, that component. So um, our rollout is, you know, we are going to be going live, um, which really means, again, the flick the, the switch gets flicked and everybody can call 98 starting in July on, on next Saturday. Um, and this landline included. Most all of us have been able to call 988 with our mobile phones. Um, but again, because of the, the um, emphasis on making sure it's accessible for everyone, they've had this hard date of July 16th. Um, tentatively, uh, we will have a press conference with the governor in um, the rotunda on July 18th, about 10 a.m. So please stay tuned for that and either attend in the rotunda or watch live stream. Um, but we'll be sending out that information. At that same press conference, we're going to be um, releasing the 988 Kentucky website, which will have all of this information, easy to assess, easy to download some of the marketing materials um, and stuff like that. So, uh, and yes, Dr. Schuster, you're exactly right. This 988 is a behavioral health crisis line, meaning it's substance use, mental health, and suicide. So all of the continuum of, of, of care. So thank you for, for pointing that out, Dr. Schuster. Um, so yeah, we'll also talk about um, the, the national, um, because this is a national thing, all of our uh, marketing is coming from SAMHSA and is available to all of us. Uh, we'll have our own Kentucky spin on things, like for example, this color in our background will, will probably be our Kentucky 988 color. Um, and all of those things, again, are available um, on the marketing resource. Um, yes, unless a medical emergency is present, absolutely. So I'm going to hand it over to Marcy to talk about the future of 988. Thank you. And I have added the link to the partner toolkit for messaging. I know a lot of folks are 
interested in that. So I just added that right there. It is at the end of the slides too. We're gonna to send out a recording and the slides at the end, I think. So um, don't worry folks. <laughs> so yes, the vision for 988. So we really want this 988 to be part of that whole system that Beck presented. So thanks Beck for, for bringing the whole picture in. Um, we really want people to be, you know, to reach that trained professional, right? Um, we want them to reduce healthcare spending. You know, we all have a stake in healthcare spending by eliminating that ER visit that is unnecessary in a lot of cases and providing appropriate treatment, we get better results because we're early intervention, hopefully. Um, and if we're not early intervention, we're the right intervention the first time, hopefully, right? Those are goals that we have. Um, we want to reduce the use of law enforcement and other safety resources. They're not the right people to show up, right? Um, like Beck said, with the plumber and the electrician, right? They're great people, but they're not necessarily the people we need. So I really think that's important. Um, and we definitely need to meet the growing need for crisis intervention at scale. We have a lot of people who are in need right now, and the best we can do is to reach out as early as possible in some ways, but if, if they get to a crisis situation or think they're in a crisis situation, because we don't always know, right? We don't. Really, it might feel like a crisis, and maybe it's really not, but that's why we call 988, and that's okay. And I think that's one big difference between 911 and 988 as well. 988 is going to be a lot more understanding if you call and need help, um, and if you're with someone who might need help, right? Um, it's okay to call that too. I think sometimes we lose that in our messaging as well. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Thanks. So yeah, this is a great slide. Megan did this and I love her for it. Um, I really like this slide. I'm going to steal it for social media. But yeah, when you have a police, fire, rescue, you call 911. When you have a mental health, and actually we probably should probably change it to behavioral health need, you need to call 988, right? So that's just really who we are. And there are different ways to reach us. And I think that's really important as well. We do have some plans for sustainable funding. Um, we really need to continue to fund this, right? You don't start something <laughs> and let it go away when it's this important and this integrated into a system of care change that has to happen. I don't think we can, I don't think that's an overstatement. It has to happen. The care system right now isn't working for Kentuckians the way we want it to and the way we deserve to have it. So we've got to do that. Um, so biannual budget, it's a temporary solution. It's also, you know, a continuing solution. We will continue to make mental health a priority in Kentucky. And it is really a nonpartisan issue. And that's wonderful. But we need to continue that funding. We haven't raised other mental health funding in a lot of ways for over 20 years. So we've got to keep this top of mind, keep 988 and that other mental health service funding that supports the rest of those things in mind when we go to meet with our legislators. Um, our real goal, though, is also a sustainable funding the way we have 911. 911 um, has multiple funding streams, but one of the big ones in Kentucky is everyone who has a cell phone pays 70 cents a month. There's just a little charge in your cell phone bill. You probably barely notice it, most of us anyway, um, barely notice 70 cents a month to help support 911. Why don't we have that same thing for mental health and behavioral health? We know that the opioid crisis is here in Kentucky. We need to be able, I think every Kentucky and I've talked to when I was like 70 cents, they're like, that's easy, we can do that <laughs> and help give someone a line. So we just need to get the approval to do that, right? We need to set up this fee. It's not a tax, it's a fee. And the real, uh, I think that's on the next slide, sorry, Megan. <laughs> so let's go to that part. Yeah, we want them to address, um, crisis services beyond answering calls. And to do that, we have to fund it as a whole. So that 70 cent fee is a piece of that, gives it to um, a group that actually gets to make that decision about where those funds go in the long run, right? We have the same kind of system with 911. Um, legislation and funding really need to go beyond answering calls though, right? Like I have mentioned um, with, the, with the General Assembly, it needs to be a big package, but 980 has to be a part of it as well. Um, we really want those mobile response teams, right? We've got a lot of grants for those and that's great, but grants run out, right? So we need to find that sustainable funding for those as well. And crisis stabilization has come and gone and not everybody has access to those. We really need to get those started again. But the real big picture for 988 has always been someone to call, someone to respond and some place to go. And I think if we keep that in mind as we go forward in our advocacy, that will help a lot. Next slide. So. Yes, you, we did fund 988 Kentucky. Uh, we did get into the budget, right? That was a good thing. We also saw House Bill 373 introduced to address our legislative needs. And you do have that website. It's a little old right now. We're gonna update it soon. I was on vacation, sorry y'all. But um, yeah, House Bill 373 was to fund that 70 cent fee. Um, we had 14 bipartisan co-sponsors. That is a win for something that was 
kind of late filed in a lot of ways. So it was really good to have 14 folks sign on. We appreciate all of them, but especially Representative Kim Banter for being our primary sponsor. Um, we hosted a lot of meetings with representative centers, and we're going to do that again. So if you have a, are a constituent of someone in the uh, A&R committee, like Jason Petrie or Brandon Reed or anyone in that committee, we would love to talk to you because we would love to have you help us bring this message to them, this continuing funding message. Um, yeah, we had those funds included the state budget, gave them a shout out. Thank you all. Um, it really was stuck, though in that Appropriations and Revenue Committee. So um, that's what happened to 373 this year. We decided we want to get a companion bill in the Senate. So we were really gonna hit some of those senators as well with some meetings and messaging. Um, it really is critical to educate people. It's a fee, not a tax. So that difference, right? Where a tax kind of goes into the General Assembly and gets thrown into the kind of the big bucket of money, right, sometimes. A fee goes specifically to the thing it's assigned for. So with 988, with 911, we do that now. We have a committee of folks that do that. 988 will be the same thing, that same bucket of money just for 988. We really want um, constituent engagement. So that's where I called out already, right? Some of those folks that we need you to reach. Um, we will have a list of folks that we're looking for to reach. Um, but please contact me or Megan. I'll throw our, our information in the chat as well. If you want to get involved or feel passionately about this, willing to meet or write a letter to your legislator, we would love to do that. And yeah. So now we're all gonna kind of share some um, ways that you can help support the 988 rollout and then we'll have time to go back and answer some questions as well. Um, so three main ways that you can help support the rollout of 988 is to first educate others on what the lifeline is, let people know. Some people are familiar with the 1-800-273-8255 number um, and they might be, familiar with our local community mental health center, but it's really important that we're taking every chance possible to educate people about this resource, what it is. Um, talking about when to call 988 versus 911, and we'll have more messaging coming up on that as well. Um, but we really want this to be a resource that everybody knows about. Um, and then advocate. Um, so we need everybody's voice. You don't have to like politics. You don't have to like politicians. You don't have to know anything about the advocacy process. Um, if you need a refresher, highly recommend Schoolhouse Rock, How a Bill Becomes a Law, because um, that's about all the knowledge I had when I started <laughs> in advocacy. But what we all do have is stories. We all have stories about how suicide and mental health have impacted us, whether um, we've personally struggled with suicidal ideations, we support somebody who struggles or we've lost a loved one. Everybody has a story and there's so much power in our stories. Um, so reach out to me and Marcy and we're happy to connect you on the advocacy process. We'd love to have your support. We'd love to have you meeting with your elected officials um, and supporting this cause in other ways. Um, join the Fund 988 Kentucky Coalition to help with our strategy and outreach. We're meeting monthly right now and having some email updates in between, um, but that's a really, really important way to get involved to make sure that 988 is fully funded, that these wraparound services, that we are fully funding a mental health safety net in Kentucky. You know, I can't remember the last time I had to call 911, but I am sure glad that I'm able to call them if my house is on fire. So we should have the same system in place and it should be fully funded and supported. And then promote. So a lot of us on here have promoted the Lifeline number for many, many, many years. Um, and we have all of our different flyers and things like that coming out. After July 16th, it's time to switch to promoting 988. I mean, the, that other number is still going to be active and you can still use those flyers and stuff, but it's really important that we are starting to ramp up awareness around 988. So that, that will be the time to make that switch. And then work with partners, local media and other stakeholders to let them know about the transition. A lot of people don't know about 988 at this point. Um, I think sometimes, I think everybody knows about 988 because we're in this little like work group bubble and we just think that it's like the main piece of news, but it's not. Um, so we need to, everybody on here to be working with local media, to be working with our other partners um, to let them know about this transition. So 
whether it's just following one of our pages on social media and sharing some updates about it, um, getting some updated marketing materials, things like that. Um, there's little things that all of us can do to help promote 988. Some resources that I'm happy to share in a follow-up email with the slides and the recording. Um, SAMHSA's website is a huge help. It gives you the basics of 988 nationally. It doesn't get into like the structure in Kentucky like we did today, but um, it will give you the basic information and basic mes messaging around the Lifeline. There's a partner toolkit. Um, you can download all the logos and branding that you saw in the slideshow today and things like that. Um, so that is just a wealth of information and you could spend a lot of time on that website. Fun98Kentucky.org. Um, this is uh, Marcy's webpage. Um, we will be updating that with latest advocacy. Um, we'll update it with any FAQs from today. There's different links to sign up and get involved. Um, so that page will continue to be updated. Um, and then on our site, AFSP.org 988, this is from our National Public Policy Office. It gives you some additional background info on 988 um, and the policy support and work surrounding it. Um, so thank you. Uh, ways that you can stay in touch, you can follow at Kentucky AFSP and at MHA of Kentucky on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, you can reach out individually to any of us today and we'll be happy to answer your questions as best as we can. And then just follow those steps to help support the rollout. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that we can see each other. But if anybody has any questions, now is a great time to ask them. Christine is asking uh, with Dr. Schuster's question, will the people staffing the line be able to help a person get to substance abuse treatment if they're ready, I believe is what she's referring to. Yeah, um, one of the things that we wanted to do with 988 is to not reinvent the wheel. So find help now KY, which was originally used to find substance use treatment across the state. Um, we are going to work with the same folks at Kiprick and the, uh, and the creators of the website, and we are going to expand the Find Help Now KY to provide mental health services. So there will be a registry available. Um, ultimately, down the line, there will be a bed registry, which is something we're working at with, like, with our hospital association, with our community mental health centers and stuff like that. So where are the available beds if needed and kind of the con on the con crisis continuum? Um, and so, yeah, we will be able to get folks um, in that co-occurring way, in that co-occurring fashion using similar methods and avenues, we'll be able to, um, yeah, get them services through both the Find Help Now KY and also through the community mental health system. So that is one of the reasons we decided to go with our community mental health system is that they already have the full crisis continuum as well as co-occurring um, treatment. So they can do substance use as well as mental health. So I think, you know, to your point, Christina and Dr. Schuster, yes. Um, now, is that gonna happen on July 16th? Probably not, right, you know, like, as, e as seamlessly as we would like, um, but we are in the works of, of creating avenues um, that are very similar to, you know, the substance use uh, treatment in like locator. So um, also, you know, our MCOs are, have been in a part of this process. And so um, folks on with Medicaid or any of the other services can, and can also use um, that. So yeah. Yeah, realistic uh, expectations, absolutely. <laughs> yes, real. <laughs> good point. Um, oh, Lori, have a Lori had a question. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, and thank you for such a wonderful presentation today. I, I truly appreciate all the work. Um, I work with the Department of Public Health um, with the Commonwealth. Hey, Beck. I work with Beck a lot. Um, quick question about if I have a different area code, if I have moved from another state. If I call 988, would that go back to my state and then be um, redirected to Kentucky? I'm just wondering how that would work. Megan, you want to take me to? So right now that is going to reroute to wherever your area code is. Um, Beck, I think ultimately the goal is to have it work like 911 and have the geolocating services 
um, but the centers do not have that capacity right now. Yeah, um, and it gets complicated, right, and nuanced when you talk about geolocation, um, because uh, again, unless we have a full plethora of plumbers needed when there's a, pl a plumbing issue, you know, we want to make sure that that active rescue um, is done in, in a way that is as safe as possible, right? And so uh, when you do geolocation, which the F FCC is deliberating um, at the, the national level on that, um, and we should know shortly, I think, um, but they've been talking about that for quite a bit. And again, kind of considering the, the equity um, and the nuances of what that means. Um, but in the meantime, to your comment, Lori, we're trying to again connect um, our call centers to each other, like in the state, but also nationally. Um, so they work on, on their call where they can find. Um, so I, I know that you're not originally from here, that's why you're asking. Um, but so you, you would go wherever your phone number is, but that same call center, because it's a national system, has a PSAP locator, which is your 911 center dispatch. Um, and they can even look in their system to see, yeah, where's Lori at? Um, if, you, if you disclose that, because the, the, the key point of 988 is that it's confidential unless you know, you're kind of at imminent risk. So, um, and that is, that's important to remember that we need to sustain the confidentiality of 988 to make sure that folks who are less apprehensive of receiving services feel more comfortable um, getting that. So everything that you provide is um, or use is about that, what you volunteered. So they're not gonna be getting your medical card or your insurance or it, they really will just get what you provide them um, on that. So, uh, but behind the scenes, they are interconnected to some degree um, with other states and other call centers and we're working on making sure that that happens. We've got a couple of questions in the chat that were direct to me. So I don't know if you can see it, but um, what will happen with 72 hour holds of the past? I'm hoping Beck or Marcy. <laughs> <laughs> so the 202 A's are not going anywhere. So the mental health inquiries are not going anywhere. Um, they are a part of the crisis continuum, um, and, and we're not even saying that they should go away. Um, we're saying, you know, I'm saying that, like, the whole continuum needs to be brought in other than just one or two options. So the uh, mental health inquiries or the 202As that the community mental health centers also do um, are not going anywhere, and they will be available for folks who are in that really imminent, imminent risk and not quite in a place to um, be able to reach out or seek services on their own. So yeah, they're, they're not going anywhere. If I might just add back, this is Sheila Schuster, you know, the, the comp care centers do those evaluations, but 202As are a legal process and the judge is the one that orders the uh, remanding of the individual to <clears throat> a state psych hospital. And then it's really in the system uh, for the psychiatrists and other clinical staff at the hospital to make a determination. So a minimum hold is 72 hours, but as you all know, people may be held for 14 days or 28 days and so forth, but that should not be affected by the 988 one way or the other. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Um, and then we have a question about the, if the same survey questions will be asked of callers to collect um, data on effectiveness, cost saving information, things like that. As far as I know, yes, it might be updated. Yeah, I think um, we are going to have to think about how we evaluate this because, again, of the confidential nature. Um, I just sent out to every listserv I'm on a national um a survey for folks who have experience with crisis services, so families or individuals. Um, so I think we'll be collecting and, and sharing out that data, um, but also with our evaluation partners, we're thinking about how to do um, how to do follow up, including uh, evaluating the service as 988. Um, one of the things I did not mention is part of 
the 988 expansion is making sure that that follow-up happens. Um, usually within the next day, definitely within the next, I think, 48 hours is the goal. Um, if that person um, confirms yes, that they would like that follow-up. Again, 988 is about voice and choice, right? Like we want to make sure folks have um, autonomy and, and choice and voice in their, in their you know, care on that line specifically. So um, yeah, that will, will, will be it. We've been looking at that, Jill, too, if you want to know more in depth. I'm on the quality assurance meeting, so we've got lots of data I can share. And we're working on streamlining what Kentucky needs out of this, as well as the national requirements. Yep. And then uh, we've got a question about how 911 dispatch centers are being contacted about 988. Um, yeah, so uh, my colleague Angela and kind of came from the um, emergency dispatch world um, or you know crisis world and so she and Mike Sinceri who is the um, executive director of the 911 service board um, which oversees and kind of does the funding and all of that with the 911 fee that Marcy mentioned earlier um, we are going to uh, individually meet with PSAP directors and um, well, probably regionally, um, but we're going to have individual meeting with the PSAP directors and that call center director in the meeting, the 988 call center director, so that they know who is doing who, who's on first, who's on second, kind of all of that. Um, but that I, I think we're planning by like October to have, or September or October, to have really individually met and done some education, answered some of the questions for our PSAP providers. Um, because like, every, like 988 is new for us, it's really new for our PSAPs. Um, and PSAP stands for Public Service Answering Point, I think, um, which is that 911 call dispatch center. So um, that's one of the, thank you. Uh, that's one of the uh, biggest areas of kind of growth that we see in this um, upcoming couple of months is that we get those 988 call center directors and those 911 telecommunicators or directors in the same room talking about what needs to happen. Um, because the tricky part about it is I can't do um, a kind of a true warm handoff with 988 because it's a national system. So if, again, kind of using Marcy and Megan as my examples, if I kind of call 911, and Marcy answers as a, a 911 dispatcher, telecommunicator. Um, she can't just do a warm handoff to 988 to Megan because it's like, what happens if Megan doesn't answer? So we're having to create like back channels of that warm handoff um, to that specific region or, or call center. So um, it's not quite as easy as a, a three-way call um, for those of us that are that old and remember that. Um, now we're just on Zoom. Uh, it's just like four thousand one call, but um, so yeah, that's one of the things we're we're really working on. Um, and because we have so many centers, those are going to have to be done regionally with the support of us at the state. Um, and so we'll have some standardized ways of doing that, um, but really just supporting those regional folks to create the infrastructure needed to do that that call transfers. I also want to point out, like the folks at 911 have been a huge help throughout this process. Um, they've advised both the implementation and the funding coalitions. Um, so we have been working closely with them. And our first responders are really excited about this resource because yeah. so often they're dispatched to situations that they're just not trained to handle. Um, and that's really overwhelming. And that hurts the mental health of our first responders. So right. this is a resource that like our 911 people, our first responders, they're all really, really excited about and thankful for, and they've been a big part of the process. Yeah, and just a huge uh, shout out to Scott Hale, who's on here um, in Perry County. He's part of our team that's looking at, um, you know, having a peer support specialist partnered with a paramedic uh, um, and doing some of that different response to these crises. So um, lots of folks, you know, I see, Dr. Pacino on here, she's also working in Louisville doing some alternative response. I know Mount Sterling has a social worker that responds um, with police. 
Um, so yeah, it's really helping them um, kind of understand the differences, but also celebrate the ways that, that it's going to be a great partnership and collaboration. Yeah, and then uh, Michael is asking, can people call for assistance on behalf of other people, such as family members? I'm going to say that's a hearty yes, please do. Um, that is one thing that is different, like I said, between 911 and 988 is that 988 is definitely for that support person, that friend who doesn't know how to respond to somebody who just unloaded on you, right? Like, what are the options in your area? 988 can connect you to those options in your area. Maybe not as seamlessly this second on the 16th, right? <laughs> but hopefully that day, but if not, you can get to them. So I do believe that's going to be an excellent thing. And, and that's something that you can already do with the lifeline. Mm -hmm. I just want to point out with the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, a lot of times people will mistake us for a crisis line. So I get crisis calls quite frequently. Um, and when I do, I will do a warm handoff to the folks at the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. And if I know exactly what region that person's in, I'll actually just call that community mental health center's um, crisis line directly. So each of them have their own um, local crisis line. Um, so that is, that's some good information to have on hand if you are somebody like me who um, will frequently mistakenly receive some crisis calls. Um, but they're always, and they're always great about it. Sometimes it's a voicemail too. And I don't really know much about that person, but I will call and tell the center about um, the phone call and ask that they follow up. Even on one of Vex slides, you saw that they were anticipating so many thousand outgoing calls. And that's for situations like that where um, a friend or family member or somebody in the community has called on behalf of somebody and said, hey, can you check in on this person? Another thing I'll mention, and I think I failed to mention this in my slides, but um, we are trying to be mindful of capacity as we roll out 988 as a statewide kind of um, media. And so, you know, you all are on here most likely probably as stakeholders, as community partners, folks like doing the work and wanting to know a little bit more. Um, you know, we don't want on July 16th for everybody and, you know, to start calling 98 because we want to make sure that it's a gradual, slow kind of, um, you know, release of the information. So what we're trying to really encourage folks to do is really update your material, update your slide as community partners and stakeholders. Um, and we, we do have a statewide plan rolling this out as large scale advertising for the general public in Kentucky um, starting in 2023. But we really kind of want these six months to be about like making sure their wheels are steady. We got a good alignment. We got people, you know, going in the right direction. Um, and then we at the state will do a, uh, a statewide campaign related to 988. So um, just to, to be mindful of, of that as well. Thanks for clarifying on that, Beck. We've got just a couple minutes left. So um, Dr. Schuster does wanna add some additional comments on how you can help with advocacy. Um, and then feel free to follow up with any of us on um, questions. Thank you, Megan. I just wanna encourage you all in your role as community leaders, but also as individual citizens to reach out and speak to your legislators about how important this is. This really has to be a, a bottom up, a grassroots uh, campaign in terms of the sustainability funding. Uh, legislators are gonna be reluctant to attach a fee uh, to their constituents or they need to hear from their constituents that this line is an absolute godsend. Uh, if you have a personal story to, sh to share, that's so impactful with your legislators. So I really encourage you to get active as an individual and to spread the word in your community. Uh, let me also remind you that this is an election year. We have 53 House seats and nine Senate seats that are uh, on the ballot. This is a good question to ask candidates. Uh, where are you on, in supporting the mental health crisis line and so forth? So raise your voice. This is really an important issue. And thanks to Marcy and Megan and Beck. This has been an outstanding 101. It may even be a 202. Thank you. It might be. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Schuster. Well, um, we ended right on time. Um, we can follow up on any questions we might have missed in the chat. 
Um, but please feel free to reach out if you have questions. Enjoy your day. And um, we're looking forward to rolling out 988 with you. Thank you all so much.